how we, how the world and the political world specifically, is talking and acting on climate change, starting to undergo something of a transformation. And I thought it would be interesting to look ahead to where I think it's going, where it might settle for the coming period of decades or however long it turns out to be. Firstly, I've said it before and I'll say it again here, I do not do weather commentary on this channel. When it comes to discussions about climate change, people who are highly motivated one way or the other will be forever pointing to the latest weather extremes, hot or cold, on the pretense that it makes some sort of a point. Day-to-day -day weather events are not climate panicking or even more bizarrely celebrating when one comes along, it's about as insightful as a tennis commentator analysing each and every single hit of the ball during a match. Now that I've said that, there's no doubt that we are having a moment right now. Enough incidences of hot extremes happening on multiple places at the same time, following from a previous year that some saw features of its own, that it may represent an inflection point in some ways, in terms of the progress towards how all of this gets normalised for the future, and that sort of makes it interesting enough to talk about. The first thing to note is that there will be more of this over the coming months, probably over the next year. As you probably know, we moved to a period of El Nino this year, which often brings with it warmer climate impacts. And the fact of it is that's only just really started. Not that much of a factor yet in the events that we've been seeing over the last couple of months. Average global temperatures are thought provisionally and almost certainly de facto to have hit their hottest day on record on the 6th of July, and the hottest June on record, and the hottest July reportedly. And while I confess to finding journalists' obsession with records somewhat tiresome and a distraction from the substance of this discussion, it's hard not to be impressed, if impressed is the word, with the sharp deviation to the norm that 2023 is demonstrating when it comes to, for instance, sea surface temperatures. Likewise, Antarctic sea ice extent. And of course, all these impacts are playing out in people's actual lives. If you don't live in the UK, anyway, where it's pleasantly cool right now, in the form of extended aggressive heat waves. Southern Europe, part of the United States, part of China as well. And these are worth noting because unlike some types of weather extremes, Heat waves are expected to get more frequent and severe in coming decades because of climate change and indeed are being seen to already being doing so over the last 50 years. Countries like Spain and Italy have been hit by hotter than usual waves for two years in a row now, since last year was punishingly high for them as well. A study by the Institute of Global Health calculated that 18,000 Italians died in last year's heat wave. In the absence of major shifts in terms of investment in adaptation measures, I guess we should expect that will be replicated again with the current circumstances. Over the coming years, presumably adaptation will bring that number down, at least for a while. I mean, it's interesting. I'm forever getting comments on some of the climate change videos on this channel that the warmer weather from climate change will be so good for crops and so good for people. We'll all be flourishing away. If a one degree increase in global temperatures simply meant a one degree top up to all local temperatures across the world, that might even be true. But of course, that's not how this works. And a lot of the impacts are decidedly non-linear and often non-predictable, as we're seeing. And while the impacts are not globally catastrophic to the food supply system, as some would have you believe, at least not for now, there's every sign of it being hit negatively, not being nurtured positively. 
in Spain and Italy, for instance. The olive harvest was hit hard last year and is being so again this year. Twice in a row has thrown the olive oil industry into short-term crisis. People who focus only on short-term extremes will point out that such bad harvests, well, they've happened before. The 2014-2015 harvest was bad, for instance. And yes, it was. And hence part of the reason why I think it not especially helpful to focus on individual records getting broken, again, as journalists tend to be obsessed about. Every agricultural-based industry expects bad years occasionally. But you can see what a different feeling it must be to be in the middle of a second year in a row. And with the El Nino kicking in, what if that goes to the third year? How many of those producers just get wiped out? Now, maybe you don't care about olive producers, but these are the real-world expected impacts on real people and the real economy. Italy is expecting potentially its poorest wheat harvest since 2007, having gone from a positive expectation just two months ago to a very pessimistic one following the heatwave. This will leave many farmers not able to cover their production costs. Spain and Italy are also prime producers, for instance, of tomatoes for a number of European countries, including the UK. That harvest is likely to be a long way down, and that will drive up prices, even though the UK's production won't be affected by poor weather this year, just because we're not self-sufficient. And we could go on. Impacts in China, in India, in the United States that have been seeing their own exciting times. The old playbook, though, on climate change is still in action. Some look at all of that and catastrophize and panic. Others still clutch at straws and say things like, but it's always hot in summer and there was a hot day back in 1937, as though that proves something. And that is the old framing. One side, it's happening, we have to transform the world we live in at most massive speed you could imagine. And the other side, not happening at all. Nothing to see here. All a fuss over nothing at best, or a left-wing plot at worst. Now, at some point, how we frame all of this begins to evolve and change. And I think there are signs of that happening now. First, the physical signs of climate change in action are becoming frequent enough is that it's making those changes normalised and real. And that is going to keep happening over the next few years. That direct world experience is starting to put it into the realm of practical problems we need to deal with rather than the catastrophic potential unseen, which we can only imagine. Now, campaigners hope the more people see it, the more they will panic and they will sign up to their prescriptions and their radical action. Actually, well, so far anyway, that's not happening. Not least because the campaigners' prescriptions don't in the slightest begin to tackle the practical problems that are emerging and need solving. What we're starting to see at least in the UK, is some re-entry of the issue into the normal gravity of politics, where the detail of policies gets scrutinised, gets held to a standard of delivering, without imposing huge costs on people. So we've had this moment in the last few weeks, raging heat waves on the one hand, across the planet, significant impacts to be seen that are breaking norms and showing change faster than many climate scientists have predicted. But at the same time as that is happening, the self-same time, after three by-elections in the UK, one of them was swung by a backlash against an environmental policy. The Labour Party had hoped to take Boris Johnson's old constituency of Uxbridge, but the Labour London Mayor's programme to extend an expensive anti-motor pollution policy to Greater London rather than just the centre of London, that provoked a pushback large enough to retain the seat for the Conservatives. The anti-net zero group within the Conservative Party, which is vocal but relatively small within the Parliamentary Party, rather bigger within the party membership, they jumped on this as an opportunity. 
Now, the ULEZ scheme, so-called in London, is about air quality, not climate, but that doesn't much matter. It's an environment policy that imposes costs directly onto consumers, as do many of the currently proposed net zero policies. So they made a significant push, even as climate records are being recorded against net zero. And it gained traction, precisely because of where we've been. As I've discussed here before, where we've been is that the party in government, particularly when it was under Boris Johnson, and the opposition parties all agreed on net zero as a goal. Now, that's appropriate, but it translated into zero effective scrutiny, except of a sort that said we should go faster and we should go harder. Now, that's rarely a good thing for a policy environment. And look, I've said on here before, let's be really clear. Net zero is the rational goal based on the scientific evidence of where we are and where we need to get to. And that we should move towards it as fast as possible, I always say, but not faster. Because if you try to go too fast, you damage the health of your society, which is in itself unnecessary and bad, but also is counterproductive because you produce a backlash which will undermine your ability to take action in the first place. Boris Johnson came up with the wizard wheeze of saying that we should ban petrol cars from 2030, for example. It was one of a number of radical promises he made, with barely any sign that he'd absorbed or even cared what that might actually mean in practice. And it always looked way too ambitious about how quickly it could be done, and the unintended consequences likely by trying to do it. Now, of course, the problem you then have is that if Rishi Sunak, the current Prime Minister, reigns back on the target, as he's tempted to do, then he provokes the complaints from businesses who have spent a lot of money in the last couple of years getting ready for this promised new regulatory environment. Businesses care less about what the government's going to do than they do about the consistency with which it delivers what it promised because they have to prepare their businesses for that regulatory time. Well, now we're starting to see a re-evaluation. But not just on the Conservative side. That would be easy to write off as a temporary ascendancy from the net zero sceptic voices in response to a single by-election result and you would expect the wave to come forwards and go back and forwards and go back. We're also seeing it on the Labour side as they start to contemplate actually being in government and having to deliver what they promise. So yesterday we had former Prime Minister Tony Blair saying that the British public should not be shouldering the high cost of net zero. And in any case, he said, it doesn't much matter what the UK does in this area so long as China's emissions dwarf everything that anyone else is able to do. Now, of course, he said Britain should play its part. If you own one hundredth of a problem, that's no argument for doing nothing. But getting all radical about cutting emissions faster than the public will bear, making people impoverished through action that is just going too fast without too little scrutiny, there's just no point. And his message in this regard is simply chiming with new notes of caution coming from the Labour leadership. This is new. And it's recognising that this is the real world we live in. Yes, we have something that has become a practical, immediate problem, the extent of which is becoming visible and hence will become normalised. There will still be some arguing from first principles for decades to come, no doubt. But they will become increasingly placed in the flat earth category of credibility. The smart ones will ease their way into a new set of arguments. But now, at least, rather than all sides joining together in the fantasy that you can just pluck ever higher targets out of the air and make it happen purely by wishing for it, you actually have to find policies that don't hit people too hard, that will mean potentially moving a little more slowly and a lot more deliberatively. It'll probably bring a harder edge to geopolitics as well. China is both creating more emissions today and tomorrow, whilst also investing heavily in renewables and trying to corner the market in those technologies. How that plays out is going to be probably pretty uncomfortable under almost any scenario you care to paint. 
There are other aspects of all of this that remain speculative. Will this new settling in remove the power of extremists or will it enhance it? Will we see the rise that I predicted before of small bands of activists prepared to move from non-violent to violent protest because they persuaded themselves literally that they are warriors during the end of days? Whatever, the framing of big problems like this evolves over time, it evolves slowly. It's not going to suddenly turn into the new phase tomorrow. But we are seeing the sign of the beginning. I think because of the culture war stuff in the US, the cartoonish extremes of its political leaders on both sides, it will happen there later than it's happening elsewhere, certainly when it's happening here. But I do expect to see the shift in many more places. Worth looking out for. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. 